Kinetics of Nuclear Decay. In this video, we'll review first order kinetics because that's what radioactive decay follows. So we'll be able to determine the half-life, K, or percent decomposition given information about a radioactive system. We'll then describe how carbon dating is possible and why there are problems with this, especially in the past, many of which we've fixed now. And then we'll quickly cover two other types of radioactive dating. We're not going to go over those in detail, so I'm just going to let you know that they exist. First order kinetics has only one reactant, and you should refer back to earlier chapters if you are having problems with this. But recall that for first order kinetics, your rate is equal to K times the concentration of A. Now, in kinetics, you'll sometimes see this written as this, T equals lambda N, where T is the rate at a certain time, lambda is the decay constant, and N is the number of radioactive nuclei at a time. It's effectively the same equation, it's just sometimes written a little bit differently. Mostly, I'll continue to just use the normal, the normal first order kinetics equation. Also remember that we have our integrated rate loss, and that this is going to be a very useful equation for us especially because this ratio here will allow us to use percent decomposition as a way to figure out how old something is. And then of course we have our half-life. I'm not going to re-derive these for you. Um, you. You have those in earlier chapters, you've done those in earlier classes, so refer back to that if you need it. Let's do an example. After 500 years, a sample of radium-226 has decayed to 80% of its original mass. Find the half-life of radium. We need to make sure we're always careful about how the percents are worded. We're going to actually do one of each type this time. In this case, I say that it's 80% of its original mass. And so we know that this is going to end up winding up being 0.8 when we get there. Now, what we can do is we can rearrange these two equations. So let's take our integrated rate law and we'll rearrange for K. We'll fill in our 80% into here. We know that it's 500 years old, so we fill that in here, and we solve for K. Why did we solve for K? Well, because then we can fill into our half-life equation. We fill into our half-life equation, and we get 1590 years. And this is a useful number that we can use from now on for radium-226. Of course, you would want to know how to do this in reverse. If I were to give you the half-life and the percent decay, you'd want to know how old it is, too. And we'll do an example of that later on in the podcast. Now let's talk about carbon dating. When nitrogen is bombarded by cosmic rays, it can turn into carbon-14. Notice that normal carbon is carbon-12. A certain percentage of this will exist within living systems at a given time in history. What happens is that car that plants takes up this carbon in the form of CO2, and then they incorporate it into their life. Animals eat the plants, and so all things that were once living end up with a certain percentage of carbon-14. They, of course, also have carbon-12 in them. Once the systems die, the carbon-14 that they have starts to decay. So we can look and we can tell how old something is by looking at the amount of carbon-14 that is present as compared to what we would have expected to be present after the plants or animals or things that were made out of plants or animals have died. So we use the fraction of carbon-14 left over to give an estimate of age of the sample. Now, there's a lot of problems with carbon dating, and this is why sometimes you'll hear that people have to go back and redate something, or things will be in a range rather than a particular date. We don't date carbon date something back to an exact year. Oftentimes it's plus or minus 100 years. And people will claim that this means that carbon dating is a fraud and that it doesn't work and all sorts of things, especially because oftentimes we do have to go back and redate something that has already been dated using better methods to get a better scan. So I think it's worth talking about where some of these problems come in so that you understand the difference between a system that is a little less than accurate occasionally and a system that is completely bad. Carbon dating is incredibly useful and really does help us. It just has a few issues. 
So originally when they did carbon dating, what they had to do was they actually had to count the decays. We couldn't go in and measure the exact number of isotopes that were present at any given time. We instead had to wait for something to decay, let it wait for a while, wait for another to decay, etc. Because of this, we had very few disintegrations per minute. And when you do something like that from a statistical standpoint, you're prone to a lot of errors. Maybe in the minute that you measured or the hour or the day that you measured, for whatever reason, you had more decays than normal. That'll throw your dating off. Or maybe you had less decays than normal. That'll throw your dating off. And that's a big problem. Luckily, we fix most of this now because now we go in with mass spectrometry and we can actually count exactly how many isotopes are present. And that can prevent a lot of the previous errors that we had. And it is one of the reasons that we go back and date things now using our new and better methods. Carbon dating is pretty limited in the timeline. It's got to be less than about 60,000 years because over time, all of that carbon-14 is decaying. And eventually it gets to the point where so much of it is decayed that small random errors will lead to really bad mistakes in actual dating. And so after 60,000 years, there just isn't enough isotope left to really get an accurate measurement. And so carbon dating is only really good till that timeline. The other place that comes into um, possible errors is calibration. We don't always have the exact same amount of radiation coming in, um, let's say cosmic radiation coming in. And because of that, things that died at different time points in our history have differing amounts of the carbon-14 to begin with, which means that they're going to have a differing amount of carbon-14 now based on when they actually were living and when they actually died. And so you end up having to make a calibration curve to, to make up for the fact that there are in fact error or there are in fact differences in the atmospheric amount of carbon-14. This isn't the only kind of radioactive dating. There are other kinds. For instance, we can use uranium-uranium, which looks at the isotopes of uranium and looks at their daughter molecules or their daughter isotopes. This is really complicated. We're not going to do it in this class. However, just know that it is possible to do. And so this is how we can get dates for something like a rock, which has been around for a lot longer than 60,000 years or extraterrestrial objects, etc. Another thing that we can do is potassium-14, which is only good to, or who's, which half-life is about 1.2 billion years. And it decays down to argon and then ends up getting traps in, trapped in minerals. And by comparing the gases that are released from this, we're able to tell about how old rocks are greater than 100,000 years. So this is actually needs to be over 100,000 years to be able to use it. And again, it's a little bit complicated, so we're not going to go into it. But know that we can do this for things that are much older than what carbon dating allows for. And we can do this for things that were not ever living before. And this is one of the ways that we're able to go back and look at geological timescales. Now let's do one more example. This time we'll do it with car radiocarbon dating. So we have ancient footprints that exist in Nicaragua and they were left in volcanic ash and mud by a group of up to about 15 people. They took soil samples that were underneath the footprints and used a mass spectrometer to show that 22.62% of the carbon-14 atoms had decayed. Notice how that's worded. They're giving us the amount that has decayed, not the amount that is still there. How old are the footprints? We're going to do the same thing that we did before, just in reverse. So this time we'll start with the half-life equation and we'll use this to solve for k. Once we get k, we can fill k into our integrated rate law. And into here, we need to be a little bit careful. We're not going to fill in 22.62. We're going to fill in 1 minus 0 0.2262. So these footprints are likely around 2,000 years old. In review, radioactive decay follows first-order kinetics, and all the rules and equations that we developed for first-order kinetics are valid for radioactive decay. Given the half-life and the percent of nuclei decayed, or the amount of nuclei that are still present, we can tell how old a sample is. We can use this to date items that were once plants or animals using carbon-14 data, and we can also do this using rocks or extraterrestrial items with different types of radioactive decay that we won't go into, but you should still know as possible.